everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be From Tech Labor Suffer 996 to Digital Labors Every Day. I'll turn it over to Suji to introduce himself and begin our session. Hello. Hey, uh, can you hear me? So uh, very glad to have a chance to speak, to have speech here for the Radical Exchange uh, Annual Conference. And uh, small correction, it's not 996, it's called 996. And I'm gonna explain what is 996 and why is tech labor 996 related to uh, digital labor and data as labor concept. So um, the topic is very, very easy to understand that you know, we, all under, we all understand that tech labor suffer a lot uh, for overworking. So 96 is a very typical inhuman working schedule, uh, mainly based in Asia and mainly based in China. So 96 refer to 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and work six uh, days a week. So we call it 96 or you can pro pronounce it in other way. And digital labor, we all, we always refer to those uh, who spend a lot of times online and give all, all these uh, data freely to those large platforms like Facebook, uh, Twitter, WeChat. And uh, it's a widely discussed concept, uh, including uh, the, the last chapter of Radical Market, uh, the data labor. So uh, again, what is 96? Uh, it's an informal and uh, uh, very inhuman working schedule that many many uh, Chinese tech company uh, and also uh, in my opinion many Asian uh, tech company are enforced their uh, their employee to do. So uh, 96 star ICU uh, it's a I think it's a originally a very fun joke that uh, an anonymous uh, developer uh, he just want to refer that if you work so hard for 96 you're gonna end up go to ICU. And they even make a website called 996.icu. After uh, making a website, uh, that's from the uh, March or April last year, uh, the anonymous program actually left the community uh, and also created a GitHub repo called 996.icu. Uh, for many of, of you guys who have experience in programming, you know that GitHub is the largest uh, platform for collaborating on a, on a decentralized uh, uh, protocol called Git. And it's also, also uh, very easy to collaborate with your friends or coworkers all over the world. And after this anonymous programmer created this uh, repo, the repo uh, grew very fast and now become the second largest GitHub repo ever in the history based on the GitHub star. Now, uh, this repo got, got more than 248k, probably more right now, uh, star uh, in GitHub. That's definitely more than Linux, definitely more than Bitcoin, definitely more than Ethereum. And uh, probably if with more continuous growth, this will be the largest uh, open source GitHub protocol, GitHub repo in, in the human history. And this uh, interesting website and interesting repo is also supported by uh, a lot of OGs in this uh, industry, such as the creator of Python, Guido. Uh, he publicly said that uh, working 96 is inhuman and these developers and tech laborers deserve better life. And uh, since Microsoft acquired GitHub, there's a there's attempt to stop Microsoft censoring the GitHub or uh, try to censor the GitHub to stop this uh, repository. So there's a, a small organization, but very powerful one called Microsoft for Good. That's all uh, developers and engineers within Microsoft. They sign a petition later on, on another GitHub repo called Microsoft for Good and Microsoft developer support 96 ICU. That's another GitHub repo. And they sign publicly on that GitHub repo, say, oh, okay, we support uh, this movement, we support this repository uh, on our uh, GitHub. And uh, if our company, Microsoft, tried to censor this repo, uh, we as the engineers or the employees of uh, Microsoft, we're gonna protest within the company. 
that's a very very tough uh, statement. So uh, all these different support and all the anony anonymity uh, actually ensure the growth of this movement. And uh, I'm also one of the early initiators in this movement, but I'm not the anonymous programmer. But uh, those who are anonymous initiated uh, this report, I think it's like Satoshi, uh, it's no longer important. It's better he or she keep secretly uh, who, she, who, who she or she is uh, for, for the better of the others. And the another interesting stuff is um, there's even sub projects besides the 996 ICU. For example, there's a, a 996 ICU list for companies who uh, strictly enforce their employees to work so inhumanly. Uh, and another work list called 965 or work life balance list that uh, it's a list of companies that uh, actually uh, appreciate the work-life balance and give the employees and give the uh, developers a better uh, working environment. And there's also anti sex license, which I personally involve a lot. So what, let's say how, how this movement, how this 996 the ICU uh, get, get viral from the tech labor and get this large in let's say one or two months and still kind of have some community alive right now. First, this thing is uh, purely self-organized and it's uh, quite, quite have a lot of autonomy. So uh, there's no one in the, in the control of the uh, 96 to IC movement and who, whoever initi or who initiated that is already completely gone from this community like Satoshi and uh, the, the whole list like uh, 996 ICU bad company list or 965 work life balance, uh, good company lists are, are also forked by the community and maintained by community. And it's, it's better than, it's more creative than traditional NGOs. And it's pretty much like a DAO. A DAO I'm referring to decentralized autonomous organization. That's like the, uh, we, we talk a lot in that in blockchain, uh, Vitaly also talk a lot about, about DAOs in blockchain. So it's like that, even though it's not blockchain. For example, one uh, here, one case is uh, all these programmers uh, they want to put the name of another huge company, ByteDance, uh, the control company of TikTok. I put them on the uh, bad company list who enforce the employee to do an exercise you. And uh, uh, the employees uh, or the other people from ByteDance actually say, uh, this is not uh, correct, this is not real. We are a good company, so please remove us from this list. And they, they uh, have a pull request. A pull request means they want to delete or alter some part of this code or some part of this document. Mm -hmm. A very interesting thing happened even without a centralized, uh, let's say, founder or centralized uh, creator. Uh, the attendees of this movement, they uh, suddenly turn into a voting mode. Everyone start to vote, use the GitHub original functionalities emoji, voting by emoji. They start to vote and to decide whether this statement that uh, Biden's do respect uh, uh, workers' uh, life, uh, work-life balance is true or not true. Because there's a lot of people who are in the journalism industry who also worked for Biden's before. And after, let's say, one, one hour, there, that here is the example of there, we have like 278 used, uh, you know, this is not true emoji and 28 used the unhappy emoji. And obviously by you know, simple voting, uh, people agree or the community agree, this is not true. So uh, they, they will not delete the name of Biden's from the uh, back company list. This is very interesting and very powerful when I first see it. So um, let's say uh, what, we, what I, uh, what we kind of participate, how we can participate in the movement. So there's another attempt to do a license called NT96 license. It's based on the spread of the uh, free software movement, even though it's not really an open source license because it do limit some uh, right of other users. So in the old time, if an employee or uh, employer have some problem, they're gonna only rely on the judgment of the labor administration department or rely on judgment of the court. And 
by bringing this thing into your license, for example, uh, by writing down anyone can use this software uh, freely without charge. But if you do violate your local labor law or, or uh, international labor standard, uh, you will not, you're gonna, you, you cannot keep using the software or you cannot keep using the source code. By writing a license like that, it actually makes this thing more complicated. It brings the copyright owner, which is the creator of those open source library or the foundations behind these libraries, uh, on the same side of those employees or of, of those developers. So if a developer use these famous open source library or uh, you know, well done open source library during his or her work for an uh, inhuman employer, uh, and turns out that uh, the employee is uh, forced the uh, employee to 96, he, the, the employee can ask for help from the copyright owner, which is the software uh, creator or the foundation behind the software to sue the employer for uh, copyright infringement, which is, uh, which is governed by the copyright office in different country or in different, completely different area. So it's very interesting to rebalance this whole uh, tension or the whole relationship between the employee or the employer. And I think some of the concept is also covered by the radical market. And uh, in last May, I also wrote a blog post on the radical exchange. You can find this through the link here, or you can just go search on um, uh, 9SX ICU radical market uh, radical exchange blog in the in the previous blogs. So um, how this thing related with the digital labor or how this thing related with the data as labor? Uh, well, first thing we're gonna say, uh, well, tech laborers like programmers, developers, they're very, very close to uh, who those who create the mechanism for digital laborers. Uh, the reason we will have the, uh, the concept data as labor or digital labor is there's a lot of, you know, really, talented uh, programmers, really talented engineers who design and who wrote all of those codes, who wrote those AI or machine learning code and absorb data from the users and train them to make it into algorithms and to make it into a big data app. And the, te the tech labor's problem is more like traditional labor's problem in, in the brick and mortar world that they suffered from the unfriendly on our inhuman working environment. They suffer from uh, super long working hours. They suffer from, they don't have a labor union. They don't have a government who support them. And uh, I use this, you know, simple diagram as an example that they're, uh, they have the same problem of the, you know, traditional labor. And they have the same problem of uh, uh, pushing from the factory owners, like uh, large companies. And and the intent today uh, actually also have the same problem uh, for digital laborers. So the intent today is definitely not a free market. The user have a lot of things to do, a lot of things to, to use freely. They can use the platform for free. They have the efficiency of big data and AI. No, you are better than you think, but the user don't have the free of migration. Uh, the platform can just ban competitors or cap copycat different functionalities. The user don't have the freedom of decide what to read. That's manipulated by the big data. The user will lose the price integrity. They will have the price discrimination. And they, they use the, the general public don't know how their data is used. And these are all because of the unfair term of service and uh, which uh, Mark Zagor, the CEO of Facebook Public, say that he, I do not, he personally don't read the uh, term of service of Facebook as well. So uh, I guess it's super long and no one really knows what's in it. And by signing an unfair term of service, you're basically giving all the also to the uh, devil. And it's like you by signing a very unfair employee contract you're giving out your uh, you know physical working time to your employee uh, you have to work 9 6 or you're forced to work 9 6 and so you can use we're going to use this diagram to refer to the situation of data as labor or digital labor in the cyberspace that uh, 
people like us don't really work in a factory. Uh, we we use our laptop, our mobile phone to work, but all our working fruit, all our data are stored somewhere in a very remote and protected server, probably maybe in a different country. And uh, the free market is not really free. It's actually mon monopolized by several companies like Facebook, Google, uh, and it's gonna it's like the free market, but you have to obey the uh, several rules. Like you can only buy data off your social media. You can only post uh, advertisement of certain social media in a certain uh, platform. And if I am Satoshi, by looking of this diagram. Uh, I probably will find out the vulnerable part of this ecosystem of this, you know, current workflow is the money, is the fee money. And uh, by looking through the tech labor and the problem of uh, their labor every day, uh, well, the, the, the initial thought of many people is, okay, this sucks. And I don't really like Facebook. I don't really like all these platforms. Why can't we just build our own platform? Well, why can't we just migrate to the new internet? Uh, why can't we just migrate to blockchain or Web3 or whatever uh, interesting or great you know, name of a new internet? Well, definitely that's a good you know, uh, uh, attempt, uh, but it attempt by many and all of these attempts attempt are failed. Uh, 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 for example, Telegram uh, even got so many users, uh, you're gonna see uh, it will never turn itself into a decentralized network. And unfortunately, its tone network plan is also failed due to the regulations. And let's see for Darknet or uh, Onion Network, even though they got a large support from the United States government uh, in different ways of donation, um, these truly secure services are either too geeky or they even condemned by mainstream medias. The mainstream medias will view those who use um, Tor network for daily basis as let's say terrorists or people who, uh, you know, who 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 are sex or uh, deal drugs every day, which is very which is untrue. And by using the nothing to hide theory, you cannot really build a truly secure services. And uh, and also they are really hard to use. The user experience are really bad. So all these attempts attempt are failed. And the real problem is not really build another uh, new internet. It's not really, okay, tell everyone your data is being collected by Facebook, like your data is, your labor is being uh, misused by an employer. Now it's a different issue. The real issue is, uh, okay, we know there's a problem with the privacy control and data ownership, but we, we still want to have the efficiency of the Facebook or of the, of the big data and AI. And can we have both? Can we have both uh, without any, uh, any, any change in the user experience? And can we do not go somewhere else? Can we just stay on Facebook and Twitter? Can we just uh, have no need for migration? And that's a really tricky problem because I think no one had ever thought of this solution before. Uh, we just stay within Facebook, stay within those monopoly platforms and protect ourselves by, okay, somehow we enter into a parallel dimension and uh, we force those monopolies to become a good, good, a good platform. We force them to become better. Is that really doable? And if it's doable, how can we really achieve that? So this is uh, the, main, the main point of today's topic. How can we really achieve that? How can we really, uh, using Microsoft's tool, GitHub, to protest that Microsoft probably has some inhuman in working schedule in China as well. That's a really uh, you know tough question, and we uh, we can learn from the radical market. There's some sort of this uh, this part from the last chapter, data slaver, and uh, early last year, uh, Jennifer, uh, CEO of Radical Market, Radical Exchange, also came to Shanghai, and we have a small meetup in the Shanghai Jordan University to discuss this issue with the professors and regulators there. Uh, and uh, happy that Jennifer used our product, Masuka, as an example. So how can we really achieve, you know, uh, let's stay in Facebook while simultaneously protest within the Facebook and about our data issue? How can we achieve that? So uh, if we really view 
those platforms as just another layer of infrastructure and view Facebook just as the factory. Uh, why can't we do something within it? Because in the traditional factory, you can definitely uh, form a labor union, you know, within your factory. Uh, you can also, you can always, you know, free free to, to talk to other workers, talk to other uh, tech laborers that, okay, this is not really good. This is not right. We should do something else. Uh, this is not definitely doable. Uh, but I don't think uh, it's super easy to do in, in within Facebook because that's not really a physical factory. It's a, it's a decentralized, it's somehow, you know, quite digitalized factory. We learn from the history uh, that this kind of case actually happened before. So back in the 90s, uh, we also have an infra, which is the operating system. And Microsoft Windows is the dominant operating system since the 90s, and it's definitely a monopoly uh, product. A uh, wide range of software on, runs and only runs on Windows and on, only use Windows APIs. And all these attempts to build another operating system for consumers uh, actually don't really work. Uh, both Linux and uh, Microsoft uh, and Mac OS don't really have a large enough traction to beat up uh, Windows. The only thing work uh, is the, the, the navigators, the Net Netscape navigator. They build a broader within a bro uh, the OS. And after introducing JavaScript, which you can develop a program within a website, and you can connect to your website freely without being censored by Microsoft, because that's another layer, that's another open new world. Uh, it, it becomes uh, more like an operating system. So browser become more like an operating system so that uh, the uh, traditional operating system become uh, a relatively not interesting business. So that's why uh, Microsoft is so pissed off by the Netscape Navigator. And they even have a large fight in early in the early 2000. Then and that uh, Bill Gates retired from the board of Microsoft. That's also that's the reason why it's so important that you can actually replace the OS by becoming a browser in the OS. The same thing also happened for uh, infrastructure like uh, AT and T, which is also a widely recognized monopoly back in the early days. That they have the they have the large uh, network effect of your mobile phone number and your contact book and you know or the SMS and all different you know technologies and the WhatsApp or any other kind of instant messenger they build definitely on top of the messaging and cellular networks but by using the HTTPS or any standard layer of encryption the phone carrier have no way that what you're doing over top of the SMS or cellular network. So you can tell your friend that I'm on WhatsApp now, or I'm on iMessage now, and all, so all of a sudden, all your friends will easily transmit to a new layer or go to a new layer, because this new layer have no difference uh, than the traditional one. And it becomes more open that you can even write a program for WhatsApp, but you can never easily write a program for at and So that's also an example of uh, the over top strategy or build a window, build an open window within a closed system. So let's go back to the, the problem of huge, you know, digital factory or a huge place for digital uh, labor, Facebook. So why can we create a huge cooperative or a union within the huge factory, the huge data labor factory like Facebook? So uh, here's our example. Uh, we call it MathBook. That's a bridge connect Web 2, uh, the internet we're using today, and Web 3 that contains many cool technology like peer to peer network or blockchain. And MathBook is a network just connect the current platforms and the decentralized world. So, okay, how, how can we really learn from the experience of the 96, learn from the experience of the Netscape Navigator v Microsoft, and really build something within Facebook? So here's a very simple example, I guess. After viewing this, you can understand what we're doing. So uh, you will see a pop-up gonna encrypt all the data you post it on, on Facebook and there's no server. So after you post it, you're gonna turn it into, this is for DevCon, 
and uh, I'm gonna use another brother or demonstrate that I can, I can decrypt this post. So after I, I install the plugin on another browser, uh, this Mr. Roku Leo will find out, okay, Suji's post is encrypted and he gonna post, uh, he gonna post wow. And then you can see, oops, you can see that this post is decrypted automatically by his or her software. Macbook on his or her own laptop without really communicating to Facebook server. So it's like you can build a layer on top of Facebook without let Facebook know you're, what are you doing. And then here's another example that uh, I can, uh, cause uh, information is, it can be encrypted, sent over Facebook and Twitter. And cryptocurrency is just another way of express information. It's just you know, a way of put money inside a bunch of encrypted information. So that's we can send a red packet over Facebook or Twitter. Uh, you can send 0 0.1 DAI, US dollar stable coin, and say, happy Chinese New Year, happy Lunar New Year this February, and then boom, uh, it becomes some gibberish and send over Twitter. Boom, and becomes a real red packet with money inside it. And uh, basically, with MassBook or without MassBook, uh, you can view the world differently. Uh, if you're with MassBook and you become the recipient of certain message, you can see what's really in the message, whether it's money or uh, just a text message. Uh, without MassBook, or if you are a server of Facebook or Twitter, or let's say the regulators or uh, the government agency who want to spy on you, you're gonna see nothing but gibberish or nothing but emojis. And here's an example of you can actually claim the red packet freely without worrying about KYC or with the worrying about giving out the data. And all of a sudden you have like five die, five US dollar claimed in your red pocket without let Twitter or Facebook know anything. And in this February, we see that uh, we're happy to see Vitalik between the founder of the and also have a test of the red pocket who uh, he probably never give is away, but this is probably the first time he gave is away. And we also happy to see the maker DAO uh, one of the largest stable coin provider is sending over red packet as well. So um, we also have an example like, oh, okay, I can actually raise money on top of MassBook. Uh, I, I think probably uh, our audience already heard from Gitcoin about their QV funding model for uh, funding open source or funding activism. Uh, but uh, with help of MassBook, you can send over a link of Gitcoin and send over uh, on top of Twitter and Facebook. And all of a sudden, uh, you can just fund over Facebook and Twitter without letting Facebook and Twitter know what are you doing. That's pretty cool, right? And, and why this approach? So after we really considered uh, the past and the history or for the iteration of technology, and after we learned from my personal experience and experience of many, many protesting and activism in the past. Feel like this is the most efficient way. You have to have something built within the current ecosystem and grow, uh, the growth can be much more faster and, and you can pro create most uh, programmable and open uh, data and digital asset within the ecosystem. I'm gonna generate the largest amount of encrypted data and digital asset from the general public state surfing. You don't really to need to teach them, okay, there's a new world called Web3. And there's a guy called Vitalik Buterin, he created Ethereum. No, you just go uh, use a single plugin or single uh, software. Uh, it's very simple to use. And all of a sudden, you gain the uh, autonomy uh, of the, all those geeks. And let's go back to, let's say, the tech labor problem or digital labor problems. Well, we all agree data is just another new form of labor. And there will be a new form of business for those data as labor or data units. And by, by our approach, I believe there'll be uh, soon like data unions or data DAOs, uh, like streamers or other projects are doing, humbrews by this kind of software. And, and wait, okay, uh, what do we know about the traditional unions and digital, digital labors? Let's go back again to this graph that we see uh, the the general public has become the user and become the free labors of the, of the monopoly platforms. And they got, give out the data freely by those mobile phones and laptops. 
and the, the data is traded for money and everyone has a query line, you know, they are, they are under surveillance of big data. And what all those cyber punks or those geeks want is a better word that you can replace the money uh, printed by uh, a government from, uh, you know, all these fiat money to uh, stable coins or probably uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. And you can use decentralized finance to have a better credit system, have better uh, uh, manipulated policy. And you can use IPFS uh, or probably Solid for decentralized storage so that you don't need to worry about all the data stored somewhere you cannot control. It's actually encrypted and stored everywhere. And you can use edge computing and uh, multi-party computation or these new technologies to compute your data locally and safely without having a monopolized market for data. Well, that's really cool, right? And you can even have a you know a blockchain phone or encrypted phone like HTC Exodus for your daily usage. Well, that's actually very cool, but I guess it will never uh, realize so easily. The real world right now is uh, Facebook Mark Zuckerberg want to print money as well. He want to become the controller of the new currency CT called Libra. And uh, the server is always controlled by AWS or Google Cloud. And the, the money is the, the money, money per policy on the internet, all these data, all these, you know, credit uh, data is controlled by Visa, Master, or PayPal. And all the data is collected by Google or Facebook. And even the, the even worse thing is, well, this Libra thing can be replaced by any, any uh, nationalism power. That's what we see in the past few years. And I guess we will continue to see this kind of threat, this kind of trend in the next four or five years. And uh, it not only happened in America, it also happened in Asia and European countries. So that's a really bad sign. So again, uh, th these are really huge problems, but how can we really, you know, as a data user or as a, someone who know about uh, some problem of the data labors, how can we really change something? How can we really uh, force Facebook, force Twitter to be a good platform? or force them to become a better platform, otherwise they're gonna be dying. Well, this is very simple. By encrypting your data, you actually own your data. This is very easy to understand. And if you post the encrypted data within the platform like Facebook and Twitter, you're actually protesting within the platforms. Uh, it's like when you use Microsoft uh, GitHub to protest against 96.ICU, you're actually protesting within the Microsoft, within all of those huge companies as well. Uh, and by encrypting your data, you're actually protesting in a much more, uh, much more larger scale that everyone, everyone, everyone on Facebook cannot view your data, expect your friends or who are selected to view your data. And if we view Bitcoin and Ethereum, as an uh, open, open money system or uh, open com world computer who can empower this uh, new technology, this new kind of uh, freedom to everyone on the internet. Uh, MathBook is ultimately trying to empower this freedom to all those digital laborers, the freedoms we learn from the tech laborers movement, from those who are geeky, who can understand GitHub and who can understand the difference between uh, all this open source software, we want to empower this kind of uh, uh, rights to the general public, to the daily internet users, and you know, uh, make something digital laborers can use every day. So what we're doing, or uh, what we're trying to persuade people to, to go is to not really build another social network, which I don't think Personally, I don't think it will work. And uh, financially, I don't think you will have enough funding to beat Facebook or Twitter. Uh, don't really build yet another social network. Build a data labor union or a cyber union or probably a DAO within the, the platforms. And platforms, uh, the platforms can have a DAOs homebrewed within the platforms. And the DAO is, is the, the place that you can gather the user's opinion. You can let the users vote. Well, don't really need to be very serious about voting. You can even use emoji to vote, but it will be very efficient and be very easy to use. And 
we learn from history that in the traditional factory, there's also a physical labor union that gathered the opinions and helped the laborers do the protesting and to, to gain their rights. Uh, I guess this time to have a cyber union. So this is the end of my uh, speech today that we want to learn from the tech laborers who suffer from NSX, from my personal experience and from my uh, personal activism history and put them into today's uh, the hugest problem, largest problem of the world, the digital labor, and uh, how can and, and use software like MathBook to just go, you know, protesting within Facebook and Twitter and force them to become a better monopoly uh, if they are not gonna, you know, uh, change themselves. And we're happy to see that uh, CEO of Twitter, Jeff Dossi, he actually claim, he actually say last year that they're gonna change themselves. And let's see what's gonna happen. Feel free to join our Telegram or follow me on Twitter or follow me on Mapstown, the federal Federals. And uh, also feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Okay, we, we have like four uh, questions from the audience. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna answer all these four questions. We still have 15 minutes left. So uh, the first question is from Matt. How can we get more resources from civic sector tech projects? It seems like maybe a little more financing could pro improve the ecosystem a lot. Yeah, uh, so let's say one of the largest problems is always fundraising for those specific projects. Uh, I guess in the US, you can easily set up a 501c, a nonprofit organization, but still many are unwilling to really set up a, a traditional NGO to raise money. And if you raise money as an individual or as an anonymous individual, I don't think the traditional platforms like Patreon or Venmo or PayPal will allow you to take a lot of money. If you do take a lot of money over 10K, uh, the, usual, the outcome usually is your PayPal account will be banned, which is my case. And, uh, or if you are using uh, uh, liberal pay or open source uh, fundraising tools, they will have to take 10% to processing the money for anti-money laundry or KYC purpose. Uh, so that's why we choose to partner with Gitcoin. I guess uh, one thing we're gonna do in the next several months is, is to persuade more and more people to use Gitcoin. And okay, you can take you can take uh, fiat money or stablecoin if you want. There's many uh, problems of uh, regulation we have to uh, feel we have to fix right now. But I guess in near future, everyone who actually have a civic uh, sector or activism project can easily go on these platforms and you know have a link and uh, go go have someone funding for themselves without worrying about their real identity will be revealed or they will have tax problems or they have problems about you know ml or they have problems about the financial infrastructure and for now i don't think there's a place to list all those uh civic sectors of the projects well unfortunately because they don't really want to use Patreon or traditional ones. Tradition and GitHub is the only way, uh, only major platform they're using. And from anonymous person, how do you see Black Lives Matter activists can use MassBook and like many project to make change? Yeah, so uh, the one thing I noticed is because I used to, well, I think uh, three, four years ago when I was doing the US, I used to use my personal PayPal account or personal Venmo account to, to help some activism or help some you know, small uh, NGO group to raise funding. Uh, sometimes they, they just don't have a proper uh, person to manage the account or they don't really want to uh, open a Patreon or they want to prefer use Venmo or the other traditional ones. And ends up, if you have like a very hot tweet like you have a 10,000 retweet for a single incidents, like protesting, whatever, and you post your Venmo or uh, PayPal QR code there, uh, you receive a lot of money, your account will be freeze and your money will be freeze as well. 
So at least what we want to do is we want to tell the people, well, definitely you can use Facebook and Twitter as a platform to promote your uh, activism or Black, Black Lives Matter uh, activist jobs. And when it comes to raise money and when it comes to install some kind of anonymity, you should go use Facebook without leaving Twitter and Facebook. So it can give you some kind of control over your personal data and the personal, uh, you know, fundraising process. That's a very important thing. And as I say, we're going to partner with GitHub to do so. And uh, from Fanny, uh, a lot of projects don't raise much money with the Gitcoin grants, even with the quarter funding matching. Do you feel this model is sustainable? Uh, will continue. Well, that's also a problem. I am gonna dis I'm gonna discuss with Gitcoin as well. Um, for now, most of the funding of QB are from either Vitalik himself or consensus or you know people like us who appreciate this ideology and who earn some money from the past from from Ethereum or from other other uh, cryptocurrency and. There's actually very few uh, open source foundations or traditional NGOs participating in this process because they, they, they still can't understand the onboarding process of donating some stable coin into this QME process. In my opinion, I guess this model will be sustainable in the next few years because there's, there's more and more people will get into this domain and they're gonna have a try and uh, foundations like Mozilla or uh, EFF or even ACLU, they can definitely try to put some grants in. But in longer term, uh, the largest problem is what, how can we get the continuous funding? Uh, and, and traditional NGOs actually don't really solve this problem. Uh, you will see those small NGOs who don't have a lot of famous, you know, uh, people who support them or they don't have a lot of bu budget uh, suffering from a very low budget. Uh, one of the solution, one of the potential solution is a proposal from Vitalik that he proposed to use uh, the, miners, the miners fee, which is the gas fee of the Ethereum blockchain. He proposed to use 20% or probably 15% of the miners fee of the whole Ethereum blockchain to fund Gitcoin. But it's also a very, very early prototype that we have many problems of, uh, you know, how can we deal with the relationship with of the miners who actually put money in uh, the GPUs or who do POS, who put money in the in their wallet and those who don't really put money, any money in but claiming all these grants. Even though they are also built, how are we? How can we really balance from these people, <clears throat> and how can we really deal with the problem of the boss trying to attack the ecosystem, trying to uh, donate on behalf of the same IP, and you know, try to get more grants? Well, that's the problem the Gitcoin grants are facing in the last last round. That a lot of people are just using the boss to try to manipulate the the QV. And honestly, I don't have an answer. I guess uh, it will continue in the next one or two years with more and more traditional foundation like Mozilla join the game. But I have no idea of the next three to five years. And from another anonymous person, are you interested also in political legal change, or do you think, uh, or do you think uh, building tech is the best way to do it? I, I definitely am interested in the. A political legal change. I'm not a law professional. My wife, Kat, she got JD from uh, the US and she also got a background in the informat informatic information science. And she's doing a lot of work in the, in the politics and legal aspects. But uh, we always feel like if you're trying to work um, from the legal or the political part, you have to start from one country to another country. You have to keep going, keep going. And there will be always some country, some, some, you know, some area that will have a very, very bad example. Like the Patriot Act of the United States is making a bad example for European countries or the, uh, let's say, Australia. 
and the, let's say the national security law or the new cryptography law of mainland China is making a bad example uh, to Southeast Asia. And sometimes it's uh, on purpose that these governments want to have a bad example. Or sometimes they just don't understand that, okay, they think, oh, okay, this is cool. And uh, we will just put this uh, proposal and give this proposal to our Congress. And it seems like they have no idea of the general purpose of encryption or they have no idea of blockchain and it got passed. And once a law got passed, it will have more, uh, you know, uh, so it will be much, much more harder to really withdraw it. So. <clears throat> the technology, the interesting part of doing it from a tech perspective is uh, from, from even today, I guess the SEC or FinCEN or CFTC or all those regulators in different countries, uh, even in, in Japan, in China or in Korea, those countries who have strictly regulated security laws, we have no idea how to regulate the Ethereum or to re regulate the Bitcoin or do we need to regulate that? And it created a vacuum that, uh, like the EFF founder uh, used to wrote the the, the declaration uh, of the uh, the <clears throat> declaration of independence of the cyberspace. Uh, whether we're not pursuing independent of the MathBook or independent of the Facebook user, I, I think it's the best way for now to really. Uh, to really achieve the global audience, to really have all those global audience understand, okay, well, this is quite simple. It's on the Google Play, it's on the Chrome extension store. In five minutes, we're joining the campaign. Uh, we don't really need to worry about the current uh, legal ecosystem uh, in our country, yeah. And uh, uh, another question from Matt, are there any big institutions behind, besides the EFF model that you think should be contributing to the QF matching pool. Yeah, uh, well, a lot of uh, institutions, I guess, besides uh, those, you know, tech uh, foundations like, uh, you know, Long Now Foundation, they have a lot of funding, uh, even for the, the long bet, that you actually bet on something that, uh, well, this happening next 20 or 200 years and they put money in. Well, I guess they can just use money they put, uh, they put in the long bet <clears throat> and to try to use the interest or use the do uh, use it on DeFi and all this money will go to QV or Q, 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 Q credit funding or and uh, uh, they probably can <laughs> use the Ethereum for a long bet and then it's going to support a QF matching as well. And another very interesting thing is I recently I talked to several uh, traditional, more traditional uh, NGO in, in Asia, they're focusing on the uh, eco uh, development of ecosystem and better uh, environment, these kind of traditional NGO. And they are quite interesting in because they think uh, a better software ecosystem, a better, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem will definitely help uh, have a better tools for empower their works and empower their uh, jobs as and you care about the society. Uh, I guess even those largest one like uh, Open Society Foundation, uh, they talk a lot about open society, but I think never, they have never talked about the concept about uh, open web, uh, open internet. Uh, in the in the past few years, or their idea of open web is completely still completely different from the ideas of the from from those who really participate in the web three or decentralization movement. Still a lot to go, I guess. And uh, yeah, I still have like two minutes left. Probably one more question, uh, or uh, if no more question, I think it's the end of today's uh, speech and hope everyone enjoy this virtual conference, yeah. And uh, go check my, if you have any more question, you can just go scan this QR code or find me on Twitter and uh, the Radical Exchange official channel, official Twitter account, just retweet uh, about my Twitter handler so you can just see the find me there as well, yeah. <clears throat>